Hello and welcome to the 905 podcast. I'm Roland Tanner. I am Joel McLeod. We started this podcast back in the summer of 2020. And in the last two and three quarter years, we've tried to cover all aspects of living, working and getting around in the 905 region. But there's one method of transportation we haven't actually paid a huge amount of attention to yet. Although it's a key element in transforming 905 cities into more attractive, healthy and people friendly places. And that's cycling. So we're going to make up for that deficiency with a special short series of two interviews with leading advocates for cycling and cycling infrastructure. Last week, the Ontario Bike Summit was held in Hamilton. The OBS is organised by the Share the Road Cycling Coalition and describes itself as the premier cycling conference in Canada, where thought leaders, politicians, senior city officials, planners, engineers and tourism representatives gather annually. Hamilton was chosen as a venue as a city that's made significant progress in recent years in supporting cycling initiatives, including Hamilton's non-profit bike share program and the Everyone Rides initiative, which aims to remove the barriers that prevent people of all backgrounds and abilities from accessing bikes and enjoying cycling. But judging by my Twitter feed, many feel there's an awfully long way to go, and there were notable examples in recent history of cycle advocates and some no notorious and thankfully former councillors butting heads. But as a relatively new resident of the city, I can say that I've made regular use of the bike share program since 2021 and been able to use Hamilton's decent, if far from ubiquitous, network of protected bike lanes as my primary way of getting around the city. It's quick, it's cheap and it's pretty darn convenient most days for most trips. I even cycled down to the Ontario Bike Summit itself in Jackson Square through torrential rain, but almost entirely on bike lanes that were either protected from traffic or on pleasant and low traffic side streets of the Kirkendall neighbourhood. I got there drenched, but without ever feeling I was within inches of being pancaked by an SUV. Then I saw a workshop presented by the Dutch Cycling Embassy, which made it clear that however far Hamilton has come, there's a vast amount more that could be done to create safe and cycle-friendly cities. So our first interview in this short series is with Eleanor McMahon, founder of Share the Road and currently president and CEO of the Trans-Canada Trail, in which capacity we spoke to her last year. In the interim between the first and most recent job, she was also MPP for Burlington between 2014 and 2018, And as both an activist and a politician, she was involved in writing legislation and generating funding that both protected cyclists and supported new cycling infrastructure. Her current day job at the Trans-Canada Trail just so happens to include thousands of miles of rural, suburban and urban multi-use trials enjoyed by walkers and cyclists coast to coast. She joins us today to speak about the current state of cycling infrastructure in Ontario, and what needs to happen to build a healthier cycling culture across the 905. You looking to make the most out of this life and optimize your personal wellness? Then check out the Natural Man podcast. Join me, host Mike C., as we explore all areas of human wellness, physical, mental, and emotional. Learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health. Remember, your doctor works for you. Learn biohacks, neurohacks, ways to improve sleep, and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com. Uh, welcome back, Eleanor McMahon, to the uh, 9 to 5 podcast. Um, great back to have you back again, uh, and this time with with uh, more of your bike hat on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> last time it was the Trans-Canada Trail, and now... Uh, to talk about well uh, the Ontario Bike Summit and uh, which which happened this week in Hamilton, which is an uh, annual annual get together, and and perhaps we'll just kick off by describing what the Ontario Bike Summit is and uh, and uh, what goes on. Absolutely, thanks, uh, Roland. Thanks, Joel. Thanks for having me. Um, love the podcast, by the way, and so delighted to be a guest. Uh, so you're catching me at a really interesting time. Um, Speaking of the Bike Summit, I'm actually leaving today for Europe uh, to attend the global cycling conference Velo City, which is um, hosted by the European Cyclist Federation and brings countries and uh, experts and enthusiasts from around the world. So 
I am speaking uh, in my capacity as a CEO of the Trans Canada Trail, but this will probably be the sixth or seventh fellow city that I attend, and it's a it's an opportunity to convene important conversations and see colleagues who are like minded and learn from them. And I think that's really the genesis of the Ontario Bike Summit is exactly the same, although on a much smaller scale. Uh, as you know, I started the Share the Road Cycling Coalition in 2007 after I lost my husband in a, um, a, a sudden and horrific sort of crash. He was uh, killed by a careless driver who was later convicted um, just north of our home here in Burlington. He was uh, on a training ride. And his loss um, uh, really catalyzed uh, our, our efforts to, to do exactly what the Velo City Conference does, which is convene experts, um, bring people together, share best practices. Because when I started Share the Road uh, and I started traveling around the world, not just Velo City, but even in the United States, and I saw what they were doing there, how they had a really strong movement of political support and public policy frameworks and laws, all of which supported cycling, very little of which we had here in Ontario, it inspired me to, to do the same. And so for 15 years now, we have brought together municipal leaders, planners, engineers, um, you know, advocates, um, public health, law enforcement, all of the usual suspects who are in this cauldron of um, active healthy, safe communities and wanting to transform uh, communities. And as you point out, not just transform communities and through infrastructure change, but also hearts and minds. Because, you know, and I know we'll talk about this today, but cycling in this country and in, and in Ontario as well has is still far too polarized. And I would argue, um, and we did some polling that we shared at the summit that demonstrates this, that more and more people want safe places to ride, regardless of whether you're a cyclist or a motorist. Uh, they want us, they want politicians, they want decision makers to make different and better decisions that are in the interest of safety for all. And there are still some naysayers who are fighting that transformative change, despite the fact that a growing number of people, an astounding number of people in Ontario actually want them. So if it brings comfort to everyone to know that more and more people want to ride their bike more and more often for all of the obvious benefits. And shouldn't we all be trying to do that? I mean, it just, to me, uh, makes absolute sense. So the Bike Summit was really um, that that um, event every year, and it's become a forum for best practices in the municipal sector. There really isn't another one in Ontario like it, and it's one of the few in North America uh, that really brings this level of decision maker together. So. It's, it's working and it's helping us to uh, lead the change that we want to see. Now, I mean, uh, the, uh, I was lucky enough to attend one of the sessions on, on Sunday and it was by the uh, Dutch Cycling Embassy, which is actually a government funded embassy, if you like, to sort of mm -hmm. spread the word about cycling around the world. Um, uh, really interesting, and the uh, um, and you have to forgive me for not remembering the names of the speakers, uh, but the, the 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 two gentlemen who, who were speaking were were just the level of infrastructure in the Netherlands, obviously for cycling. I mean, people know about that, and uh, but it is still extraordinary when you see it, and and how um, you know there are national standards for safety, how the how the design of everything is done in a way to minimize the amount of signage that's actually required that, that you can see from the design of the road what you're supposed to do and that's for both drivers and for cyclists and pedestrians mm -hmm. so they know how to interact so that there's a standard it it really is quite something and then i guess the the um uh you, you know setting in a canadian perspective you're like they're so far ahead of us. How are we ever going to catch up? And and then to an extent, there's that thing of the minute that someone tries to do a new cycling piece of infrastructure. And I remember certainly in Burlington, there's been a couple of examples over the years of a fairly minor sort of project uh, creating huge kind of a, a, a kickback. Um, how do you think we, we we do overcome these these uh, these these kind of too familiar uh, processes? Yeah, so one of the interesting things about the Dutch, Dutch uh, Cycling Embassy, I guess three points. The Cycling Embassy is, as you described it uh, perfectly, Roland, is, it is an, an, an ambassador, ambassadorial 
opportunity for the country, the Netherlands, who like the Danes, the Danes have a cycling embassy too. And what those countries decided is that they have the magic sauce, if you will, they have created a society where they found a way for cyclists and motorists to coexist. And by the way, both of those countries are robust economies. They didn't fall off the edge of the earth because suddenly <laughs> they decided that they should, that they should, you know, th these are, these are G7 countries that are doing extremely well economically. So if they found a way for cars and cyclists to coexist, I mean, really, I'm, as I'm fond of saying, we put men on the moon and brought them back again, surely to goodness, we're smart people. And these folks have done it. And they successfully done it and they've saved lives in the process they've helped their economies they've made people fitter they've kept their cities safer and more uh, convivial and more intimate and when all of us think of europe what do we think we think of cafes in the square and we think about people moving at a slower pace i mean why can't we have those things where we live if people define that as a as a really nice quality of life why should we have to go across the Atlantic and experience it on holiday for a couple of weeks? Why can't we live like that too? And increasingly cities around the world, cities in North America um, are doing it and with tremendous benefits. Um, a good example is um, New York City. Perfect example. Um, a Republican mayor, for heaven's sakes, uh, Bloomberg, um, for all kinds of reasons, including the changing climate, but efficiency and traffic. He actually said, we're going to close Times Square to cars. And people said, oh my goodness, you what? And he did it. And he led the change. He and Jeanette Sadat Khan, who was his um, commissioner of transportation, someone I know personally and have gotten uh, to call a friend over the years, uh, they transformed um, um, Times Square. And if you can do it there, you can do it anywhere, as the song says. And not only was traffic enhanced and improved, but the businesses in Times Square their profits skyrocketed because people actually were walking at human scale, going into shops, spending money at restaurants, leisurely cafe moments. All of these happen when you remove cars from the equation and you give people the chance to economically take their time, spend money, and that's what's happening. But instead, we have these unfortunate sort of attitudes here on this side of the Atlantic that if you take cars away even a little bit and no one is saying my goodness we have to live without cars i i use my car and i'm like most of ontarians in fact our recent polling shows this um 77 percent of people who cycle regularly of which i'm one also drive regularly so people are cyclists and motorists at the same time it's not one versus the other that argument it seems to me is a false narrative that is utilized by people who really don't know what to do. And so they do nothing. And instead they point fingers and polarize. And that's not what we need here. We need courageous leadership to give people what they tell us they want, which is those healthy, safe, active communities that prioritize the most vulnerable among us, our pedestrians and our cyclists and give them space. Because after all, Roland, the car, um, excuse me, the bike, that is beside you in its own safe place in a lane and hopefully a physically separated lane is the car that isn't in front of you. So you wanna talk about lessening congestion and making it safer and more convenient for all of us to take our cars when we need to, get the bikes out of the way, put them beside us, they stay safe and, and you know that we all are safer in that particular instance. The Dutch have done it. We brought them here to Hamilton there, as it happens there, <laughs> the Dutch Cycling Embassy is, I was there when it was launched about 12 years ago. It's ex extraordinary that the people who lead it, uh, Lucas Harms is the director who was with us in Hamilton, uh, bring that um, sensibility of innovation and the ability to do what the Dutch have done, which is transform their cities. And by the way, as they pointed out in their presentations, they were like us not so long ago. 30, 35 years ago, Dutch cities were dominated by cars and congestion and people that wanted to ride, but those people were getting hurt and injured and even killed, unfortunately. And they made the decision to transform their cities in the interests of safety and, um, you know, making it more efficient and low cost. Final point, we're living in times now with high inflation and the economy is a little bit uncertain. And so finding ways for people to get around 
that are increasingly efficient and cost effective, lighten their load, lighten their wallet. Why not? Cycling is the answer for all of that. And I want us to be more like the Dutch. Why, why is it that we're seeing such uh, resistance to this change, especially, you know, out of coming out of the COVID pandemic, um, mm-hmm. number of people who, 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 who adamantly were just saying, no, I'm not doing the commute. I'm not getting in my car and driving in Toronto right. or, dri- or driving an hour into my office to go to work. I'd rather work closer to home, take a, a you know, a, when I go for a coffee break, I can go for a walk around the block or I can take a bike ride to my downtown to go work, work uh, or, or, or grab a bite to eat or grab a coffee or, or whatever have you. Like it, clearly the people respond positively to that lifestyle change for the two years or so. And I'm wondering why, like, why, why, why are we just like, why are some now people are like saying, Hey, I like that. I like to keep that. Let's, let's see how, I, how we can make that a permanent, that part of the pandemic, a permanent fixture. And now we're stuck with this kind of this uh, resistance to that change. And is it just like human nature that we're just scared of, Oh, it's changed. Therefore now we must be scared of it. Cause I don't know what might happen or, or, is there something more to that resistance? I uh, I think that a lot of it is best based on perception and not reality. I think that, that there's a little bit of education that we still need to do. We're fed a steady diet of how hard this is. We're fed a steady diet of of fear because we we lose so many people. Unfortunately, I was on the corners reviewing the cycling desk, which I called, by the way, between 2006 and 12, we lost 125 souls uh, who chose to ride their bicycle for all kinds of good reasons. And I think that quite rightly so, there's an element of fear that's associated with people's decision to take the bicycle. If we had more people riding bikes more often, we would be in a situation where we would have more infrastructure for them because the number one reason people don't ride according to our surveys, 48% of them say I'm too frightened to ride. What's the number one thing that's gonna get them on their bikes um, more often and faster? Investments in infrastructure. Um, There's a pent up demand, more people want to ride, more than half of them said so. Regular cyclists, it's over 70%. They say, I would ride more often if I had more infrastructure and more places to go. So I don't know how much more clear evidence we need that there is um, you know, a demand for action here, that there's this pent up demand. And as you pointed out, um, during the pandemic, places like Toronto had added 40 kilometers of bike lanes and did active TO because people's mental and physical well-being meant that they wanted to get outside and do things that are good for their mental health, be it on a trail or on a, on a bike path and getting out and having the freedom of riding your bicycle and the ability to choose. So there was never a better time than now to think about how we can get people, how we can meet those needs, how we can make their dreams come true. If they want to ride more often, then let's find ways to to get them on a bike more often to the benefit of our congestion, to the benefit of our economy, to their health and well-being. And let's lower our healthcare costs too, because that's another thing that everyone is preoccupied by, the rising costs of things. Our healthcare system is stressed at the moment. Uh, but the Dutch have found a way to save $9 billion a year in healthcare costs. And the way in which they do it is cycling. They've invested in infrastructure. It's sort of like when the oil crisis hit, they took a right turn and we took a left turn. They they built um, invested in transit and cycling and making it easy, safe, and convenient for people to ride. And we built smaller cars. So there's a choice to be made. And, and um, we're on our way. I mean, cities like Hamilton are making really good progress. It's why we brought this bike summit there, because we wanted to shine a light on all of the positivity that's happening in Hamilton. Good political will, really good staff, well, well, and, maybe, and things are happening. So let's let's catalyze it. Could you maybe expand on that a bit? Because, uh, you know, there's that's a phrase we don't hear too often is good things are happening <laughs> in Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and Hamilton, as an example of, you know, other cities in the 905, uh, can you just expand on like what what drew your attention to Hamilton uh, and the, the what's happening there? Great question. So in 2010, uh, the Share the Road Cycling Coalition did 
bring the bicycle friendly communities program to Canada. I first saw the bike friendly program in 2007 when I attended a summit by the League of American Bicyclists, and, and, which is a Washington based organization like the, the coalition, but on a broader scale, it's national in scope. They have quite a significant um, group of staff that lobby Congress. They have a robust cycling caucus in Congress and they've achieved a great deal. And so when I encountered them, I thought, wow, I, I wanna bring a lot of this to Canada, to Ontario in particular, I've seen what they did. I saw the political champions they have and I wanted that. And so this program to me was a perfect way to recognize progress in a really positive way to encourage continued progress by rewarding uh, constant progress and also giving a really good fact-based report back to city staff and politicians to say, okay, Hamilton, you're doing really well on these five things, but these five things over here are, are missing or need work and you need improvement. So we awarded Hamilton um, a silver bicycle friendly community award. The last time we looked at their application and reviewed it was two and a half years ago. Uh, since then, they've continued to make progress and I would wager to say that they're on their way to gold. There are three gold cities in Ontario, Ottawa, Toronto, and Waterloo, meaning that they've done innovative things. They've invested in infrastructure. There's a holistic approach to getting people cycling more often. They have safety and education and awareness campaigns that positively encourage people to ride. And they're prioritizing infrastructure investments that do that because by the way, cycling infrastructure is the most, most cost-effective infrastructure above all. We're, we still need to bring roads, build roads occasionally, but when you add cycling infrastructure, you've just enhanced the economic activity on that road and you're gonna save lives. So, and it's cheap. So why not do it more often? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. it's a no brainer. It's actually, I can, I'm, I'm going to use myself as an example again, as uh, having moved to Hamilton in the last uh, 18 months uh, uh, and beca became um, basically a, a cyclist uh, primarily as my m main means of transport most of the time, um, using the, the Sobe, uh, the, the, the street bikes that you can, which are really cheap. It's a great system. Uh, they're everywhere. You can pick them up anywhere, drop them off everywhere. And it really is uh a really good system um and, and it's also just i when i lived in burlington i could count the number of times i cycled on the, on the fingers of one hand probably you know i always mm -hmm. meant to cycle more and then mm -hmm. i didn't because it just wasn't ever quite appealing enough uh burlington's a good place to i felt and you can correct me or contradict me but i felt it was a good place to cycle for recreation for exercise because there was like the 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 you know the, the 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 paths which were going to the parks and places like that is less of a good place to cycle if you wanted to go to the the shops uh, mm -hmm. and go and buy stuff. Um. So mm -hmm. yeah, Hamilton uh, Hamilton does has done some really good things. I mean, I can get pretty much anywhere in town avoiding the uh, the worst streets if you like. Um, mm -hmm. And there are some streets. I mean, I'm going to name names and. I live near Dundurn and mm -hmm. Dundurn has a cycle path on it, but I don't want to go near it because it's a horrible road uh, yes. and, and yeah. the surface needs to be replaced and uh, it doesn't feel safe. Um, and then you go on the, some of the other streets, Her Herkimer, I think that's how you pronounce it. Yes, Herkimer, yeah. I don't know how to pronounce the name <laughs> yet, where they've put the cycle path uh, protected basically by the parked cars Um uh, so you're, you're completely separated from that's the traffic right. and that's fantastic and it just changes your entire uh view oh of, gosh, yeah. of, of going down that road it's a quieter road anyway it's less less busy mm -hmm. obviously than, than uh than mm -hmm. um but yeah you, you literally see the how it changes your view of getting on a bike and, and going somewhere so uh yeah it, it's unexpectedly i've sort of found myself in this this in a more of a cycling mindset of late and it it's like yeah this is good this is i feel it's exercise i feel That's good great. after i've done it yeah. and uh and, and it's cheap. Done some good things and they, <laughs> they definitely need to look at some of their road surfaces uh, they do. Uh, i'm talking about they aberdeen do. and dundurn in particular yes <laughs> they do i've uh, cycled uh, on aberdeen i know exactly what you mean and but you, you raise a good point. It's it's the little things. It, Joel kind of touched on this earlier, and I, I may just sort of revisit the question because I would add the, the following that there's a psychology. So in some places in Ontario, and this is not unique to Ontario by any means, 
you'll see politicians say, oh, we, we built a bike lane over there. Nobody's ever on it. Well, if you've got a bike lane that goes two or three blocks and it's not connected to any other infrastructure, meaning you have to take your life in your hands to get there. And once you're on it, okay, great. I'm, I'm good for a couple of blocks. And then you have to white knuckle it by turning onto another road that has no infrastructure. That is not safe cycling infrastructure. That is not creating a network that's pleasant. <clears throat> Would you put your child on that? No, we should be creating cities and, and many cities around the world have done this already that are safe for people from eight to 80. Mean, meaning, you know, when I've been to the Netherlands, I, I, there are people in their eighties riding their bikes and they've ridden their bikes their whole lives. They, they've had the option. And when you have the option, most people choose it, especially in places like Canada, which believe it or not, 40% of our trips in Canada are under 10 kilometers. So when you think about that and you think about your daily trips, I live in Burlington, as you know, Roland, and I, I, uh, I try as much as I can to, uh, to take my bike. Um, I'm incented to take it where there's infrastructure, where there isn't infrastructure. I'm not interested because I don't feel safe. Would I take my bike more often to the shops and so on? Absolutely. I would 100%. I would take my bicycle more often um, if I felt safe to do it, but I don't. And so again, it's a chicken and egg thing. Some I've heard politicians say, well, we built a bike lane there. Yeah, but that doesn't count. <laughs> if you have a bike lane in the middle of nowhere, you, you, you may see that very few people use it because they take, have to take their life in their hands to get there. And once they leave it, they're taking their lives in their hands again. So what, what is I, it about that that doesn't make us feel empathy towards those people who are our neighbors? our friends, our family, and, and, and we should be looking after each other and we're not. What strikes me about the whole cycling debate, which puzzles me in some cases is like here in Burlington, um, I live in Burlington as well. There was a, I found an interesting map put out by the city of Burlington on all the bike paths and bike routes that were available in the city. And the idea was like, Oh, look at all the, you can go along major thoroughfares on your bike and you can connect up into this and go and park. And I was like, oh my, oh my God, it's fantastic. And there's two things that popped in my head after I saw this map. One was how poorly marked in the city these routes are. And like, I was just, there's all, they were trying to advertise, look at all the work that all we've done. I said, why is it that as I'm going through the city on a casual outing, I don't know. These are like invisible bike paths, which I think is a, is a major problem uh, to begin with. And two was how disconnected they were. Cause I said, okay, if I wanted to get from one end of the city using my bike, how could I do that? And I realized I couldn't, I, I, I cannot, I cannot get on one path and say, okay, I'm going to bike from literally you know, the Southwest corner of the city all the way to the new development in the Northeast using one, one path or like a, a route. And I it dawned on me, I said, why, you know, why, why this disconnect? Like, it's almost like it's like a tokenism, right? It's like, we built you a bike path now shut up and go away. And I, I, I and I've always wondered in a city of Burlington, Hamilton, Mississauga, or even Toronto size is that you can put a bike path pretty much anywhere. If you think about it. And, I thought, what? And, it's, and a bike takes up so much little space as compared to the, the volume that a car of any size would take up. And I said, that's a recipe for success. If you just say, it doesn't, a bike path does not, or a bike route does not have to go on a major thoroughfare. Like you do not have to put bikes on major roadways. That, that, and that's the, the debate that I always hear is, oh, we, we built, you know, um, uh, you know, we, we want to, we want to build a, we want to put a bike path on a major road, right? In Toronto, it's always, oh, they're going to turn Young Street and shrink it down by putting bike paths. Said, no, that was a good idea, by the way. <laughs> Glad okay, they but, did I, it. but my, my yeah. point was being is that it's not necessarily that case. Like the idea is that you have people who are in the subdivisions besides Young Street or besides mm -hmm. you know, the major roads. How do you get them to avoid using the road as much as possible? Because you can put those bike paths or designated bike routes in the subdivisions, hook them up to parks and then build biking pathways, you know, throughout the city that are healthier. They're not, they don't require mm -hmm. as much maintenance. And mm -hmm. 
I, I can imagine the cost in terms of the city budget is relatively cheap. Oh yeah, they're very cheap. It's the cheapest kind of infrastructure and you can so build. I, I, yeah. I'm, 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 again, I kind of come back to this: Why are we so hesitant to do this? Is, like, why why do we not have politicians at the provincial and municipal levels to just say, you know what? Part of my French, but fuck it, I'm just going to build a dirt. It's a dirt path, a gravel path, cutting through the city, so that somebody could bike from one end to the other. Like, why is this so hard for politicians to do? It's almost like a willful effort to not do it is what I'm getting at. Yeah, I, I'm going to push back ever so gently, Joel. I, I see where you're going and, and I'll get there in a moment, but I do think you need, I think it's a, a better city is one that is safe for everybody. And when you start thinking about bike lanes as an invasion of space rather than an accommodation tool, mm -hmm. cyclists are not a special interest group. They are 68% of Ontarians who ride regularly, according to our polling. That's 9 million people who are riding their bike on a regular basis. 22% of people, or over 3 million people, ride it daily. So that we're beyond a special interest group or a few folks who want to get in the saddle occasionally. These are people who are actively choosing for all kinds of good reasons that they want to get on their bikes more often. And a lot of them don't have any other choice. They don't have another mode of transportation. Mm -hmm. Just it's ten thousand dollars a year to own a car. If if you are in a privileged snack bracket, you can afford to own one, insure it, gas it up on a regular basis. But if you're a student or a knowledge worker or someone who's starting your your job and you're trying to pay your rent and a rising inflation, you can't afford to have a car. So those are very real people mm -hmm. who every day are riding anyway on substandard infrastructure and they're losing their lives. So, you know, um, places like Young Street or places in Burlington like New Street that connect people to shops, to school, to businesses, to city hall, to the downtown, those are viable routes because they convey people, people spend money once they're on them. They shop at the businesses that they pass by and park there's reams of study from around the world, including from Toronto and other places that show that cycling cyclists spend more money than motorists um, who are speeding through a city and not stopping. And that's part of what you're seeing in Hamilton. They're going to turn those, the King, King Street and mm -hmm. the and Main, and they convert them from six lane highways that existed post-war to take the, the folks who worked at the steel factories to the steel factories from their homes in the downtown. We're not doing that anymore. We don't live that way anymore. And the city of Hamilton has won two national awards for their complete complete street design for precisely that reason. They are converting that city from a post-industrial um, uh, city that took workers from A to B to now a city that where the, the, work, the, the, the workforce is different, where people are living differently and working differently and staying home more often and technology has made it so. So, you know, that transformation, though that recognition by, you know, the Institute for Transportation Engineers, uh, to name one, is a perfect example of why Hamilton is a city that's courageously decided, nope, we're going to make it possible for people to ride their bikes more often, we're going to make it possible to ride their bikes to the LRT and connect them to transit like they do in the Netherlands, by the way, in a seamless way and make it easy and safe for people. Why? To your point about the the sort of the, the dialogue that happens politically and otherwise, um, we're changing the conversation. Um, and this is what something I'm proud of that Share the Road has done over the years. It has changed the conversation at a political level and made it easier for politicians who want to make change, who want to be courageous and lead this transformation. I long for the day where it's not courageous to be an advocate for cycling infrastructure, where it's just normal, where mm -hmm. you yourself are a cyclist, because many of them are, and you and it's and it's normal. And that's what the Dutch have now. They, in a funny way, they don't go to parties, Joel, and they have conversations with their friends and say, oh, I'm a cyclist. They don't refer to themselves in that way. They don't define themselves by their mode of transportation. It's just the way they get around. I'm a person who lives in Burlington who occasionally takes their bicycle and also drives. They don't define themselves by, you know, a particular mode of transportation. So we're getting away from that. I'm impatient. I want to see it happen faster. <laughs> It's, I, I thought the parallel actually, one of the uh, speakers from the Dutch cycling embassy was, was from uh, Rotterdam. 
And uh, for anybody who is not particularly familiar with the Netherlands, Rotterdam is, is kind of a bit like Hamilton. It's like a big industrial city um, and uh, probably a little bit post-industrial too. I know it's a port city, but it, it's uh, there's quite a lot of parallels there. And it was a city where uh, uh, characterized a post-Second World War where there was a lot of destruction. They replaced that destruction with wide highways designed to get cars fast through the city or, you know. Uh, and they turned that around. Um, so this idea that 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 well, the Netherlands always has a cycling culture, or um, that well, these old cities with with narrow streets and quaint whatever are more designed for that anyway. Those are the kind of things I know. I suspect people would tend to throw up as, as reasons why you can't do it in a place like Hamilton. And it's like you can. They've done it in Rotterdam, and, and what you end up with is not just a more cycling-friendly city, but if you look at the photographs. You've got this ugly, horrible, <laughs> uh, car-jammed street, uh, you know, in Rotterdam in the 1980s, or in 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 Hamilton right now. If we're talking about King and Main, um, and transforming those into just much more beautiful streets more attractive streets uh, uh whereas king and main really are, are like barriers in the middle of, of hamilton it seemed to me since i've moved here that and they're also uh, the barriers across the, the the center of the city that that as a pedestrian or as a cyclist you want to steer clear of uh, but for people coming from outside the city they're the only thing people ever see because if you come to hamilton you can drive down king or main and it's like well why would you come to hamilton you know it's uh uh a bad first but not, on, on not much of a question, but but, but but very much a kind of point. But uh, well, the end I, result I, of all this is is more beautiful cities, isn't well, it? Well, I, I don't. I, there's something you mentioned, Roland. I, I kind of clicked in my head as you were talking. You're talking about how here in North America, we always get told, "Oh, European cities are they're narrow streets because you know they were built for the horse and buggy, you know, uh, era of, of medieval Europe, right?" And that's that's. That's how we we in North American vision, but we forgot World War II destroyed a lot of that. Well, like the 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 Second World War destroyed it, and when they rebuilt, they rebuilt it to kind of be like this modern Americanized uh, a layout, uh, including the Netherlands. And so they're they're trying to reverse that decision since the the in the post war sec era. And it dawned on me, we in Ontario are facing that current situation that we're, we're at we are actually in that that uh that predicament because the other topic we you know we religiously talk about on this podcast is housing and development and the ontario government has uh made a claim they need to build one and a half million homes within 10 years that's a lot of homes that's a lot of infrastructure that's a lot of new housing development there's a lot of new people and with that comes all the consequences of new new roads, new new infrastructure, and, and whatnot. And it's dawned on me like that's kind of kind of the the, the opposite problem what Europe had post World War II. They had to rebuild, and they rebuilt in an Americanized suburban idea. We have an opportunity now to kind of reverse that suburban idea and say, well, no, we can build maybe a bit more European, a bit more utilitarian, a little bit more. Uh, pedestrian, uh, in, in this phrase, pedestrian is a positive word. And I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm putting the idea out there, but I just see like, we're at, we're at a, a kind of a crossroads where we can build in two different directions, continue sprawl or something a little bit more innovative and a little bit more unique to handle redesign our cities in a way that is a bit more people centric as opposed to car centric. For sure. Uh, yeah. Well, cities are for people and not just for cars. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's an important point. Uh, cities are for people. The public square is about people. Um, you know, increasingly uh, public squares are around Europe have closed their inner cities to cars altogether. There are large cities, um, Brussels being one, that has converted its downtown and its places around its parliament and taken away all the vehicles. Part of that's a security, but that's a good thing. But they've changed mm -hmm. it back into the public realm because in Canada, um, you know, you're you're absolutely right. Post Second World War and the industrial sort of boom that 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 it created uh, resulted in again places like Hamilton building six lane highways basically through the city. 
That doesn't help get economic development. That doesn't make you want to get out of your car and go shopping or visit or do a slow roll through the city and stop at a cafe and meander. You just want to get in your car and go as fast as you possibly can. That doesn't incent you to stop and, and you know, it create a livable atmosphere that's attractive to people. Um, I think your point's well taken that, you know, European cities have uh, built on a much uh, smaller footprint than we have. They could have done, um, you know, the kind of sprawl that we have, but they chose not to do it. They made different choices. They invested in um, transit and cycling and those kinds of efficient modes of transportation rather than the dynamic where in a number of North American cities, people who have smaller income differentials can't afford to live in the downtown anymore. We become overpriced in the downtown. And those are the very same people that don't have access to the kind of transportation via a car that other people do. So what are our downtowns increasingly look like? Wealthy, far too many cars, not enough transportation options, people who have lower income streams, um, forced into a very narrow set of transportation options, whereas if we invested in more cycling options, they could ride a bike, good for them, good for the environment, and, and good for the city. And so expanding your transportation options comes with building a city that's more livable, even though it's more dense. So you're absolutely right. They chose, they have a large footprint. We, Those of us who've had the privilege of going to Europe know that these cities are concentrated in a, in a hectare, a hectare is, you know, a, an environment that is much more enclosed, surrounded by beautiful countryside. Could they have built into the countryside? Yes, but they chose not to. They went up mm -hmm. uh, because they didn't want to build the unbikeable, unlikable landscape. They didn't want to lessen people's transportation options and force them to have to take a car everywhere and also put them in a situation where those lands need to be serviced. So yes, we're building more homes, but we have to think about schools and services and sewage and running pipes to get people's houses up and running and electricity grids, all of which add to our energy woes. Whereas if we built in a more densified environment and the current government is making decisions about changing the way we build our cities that are going to have lasting impacts, I would argue, in not necessarily a positive way. I think we should probably leave it there. I know we've we've kept you longer than uh, than than we should have done. <laughs> you have well, you have to get a plane to, to catch, and um, yes, <laughs> uh, you've been very generous with your time. So thank thank you. Oh, it's my uh, pleasure. And we could talk about this again. I think it's something we want to return to again in the future. Um, but uh, in the meantime. Uh, Go and catch that plane. <laughs> thank you. And uh, thank you, Joel and Roland, for a very thoughtful conversation. You're both so engaging on this topic. And uh, don't hesitate to invite me back. You're right. There's lots to explore. So I look forward to that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. That's it for this episode of the 905er. Thank you for listening. As always, you can send us your feedback, thoughts, and concerns, or ideas for future episodes to our email, info at 905er.ca. We love to hear from you. You can help us keep the 905er going by financially supporting us through Patreon as well as PayPal. Visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab. As well, links are in the show notes for your convenience. Lastly, you can find us on social media. Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time.